Goldie here, and today we're going to talk about wrestling. On today's episode, who is the number one contender for Gunter's Intercontinental Championship? Why can't we write decent feuds for women's title matches? And we finally got what this podcast predicted a while back, an amicable contract signing on NXT. Uh, let's get things started. Uh, once again, joined by Don J. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. And joined by Godflow as well. Godflow, hello. How we doing today? Excited. Excited indeed. Now, normally what we would do is start just in order um of what aired, we would start with SmackDown, then we would do Raw, then we would do NXT, then we would do AEW. But I was told um, we had to go backwards today. Don Jay, is there a particular reason why we're starting with AEW? We are starting with AEW because Goldie went to her second ever live wrestling show, AEW, in her hometown of Winnipeg. So we must get her view of a live Big brand promotion. Obviously, the indie show was great because you've got up close and personal. But this is this is like the second biggest promotion in the world. So we want to hear everything you've um, experienced there yesterday. Um. Yeah. So you you did mention it. The um, the first ever show I went to. Um. I went to a Winnipeg pro wrestling show with my father. Um. Very small venue. Very up close and personal and intimate. Got to meet some of the wrestlers afterwards. Um, this was at the Canada Life Center where the Winnipeg Jets play their hockey games. So big arena. Um, I got there just before six o'clock. So by the time I got through and settled in my seat, they were just starting the elevation tapings. Um, and we went from basically six o'clock to 1030 wrestling like they were taping matches and all sorts of stuff. Um, it was it was really cool. They did like an hour of elevation and then they did the two hours of dynamite and then they taped an hour um of rampage and then um you touched on it. It was in Winnipeg. Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, Don Callis, all from Winnipeg. So kind of special that they got to come here. They all stood in the ring after the Rampage tapings and basically just kind of waxing poetic about um, Jericho did mention it in an interview why he thinks that Winnipeg was the catalyst for AEW um, and that would be him and Kenny Omega selling out the Tokyo Dome for Wrestle Kingdom 12 uh, booked by Don Callis and then that apparently received you know such great accolades that Tony Khan decided to pull the trigger on starting a promotion. Um, I'm not saying that's like a fact. That's just me saying what Jericho said to us in the crowd. Um, they all got Wasak Jets jerseys, which are like the indigenous logo. Um, it was really, it was really neat. It was really neat. I had nice seats. Um, it's over. Uh, behind the camera to the right, so kind of looking down at the corner of the ring post. Um, so seeing the action with my own eyes, I had really nice spot for it. Um, I was I was too far away from Big Show to get a picture of him, but he was there apparently. Just this tall, dark shadow on the other side of the arena. Um, yeah, it was it was enjoyable. I, I don't know. Do either of you have like? questions for me about i don't know really what to say other than it was fun i bought a so shirt i would so being that you're not a quote-unquote aw fan but you right. know people in the promotion based on where they've been all over um in professional wrestling what was the sense like give me the vibe of how you felt about watching their performances live as opposed to the shows that you watch on a weekly basis on television? Um, so for me, it doesn't really matter what the name of the promotion is. I just like watching good wrestling matches. 
Um, they could have been called Don't Watch Us Wrestling, and I so would have still enjoyed it. Um, it's totally different watching it live as opposed to um, a weekly episodic taped episode. Um, I realize that's kind of repetitive, but... Absolutely. Um, like, not having the commentary team talking over, um, getting to hear the crowd chants, um, getting to, like, hear how loud Brody King's chops actually are. Like, that shit echoed in the arena. <laughs> and you don't, you don't really get that um, on TV because they can doctor things. But, um, you know, hearing the wrestlers react and hearing the bodies hit the canvas and all sorts of stuff, it was... Um, it's definitely a different viewing experience. It's one that I would recommend um, to people if you haven't had the opportunity to go to... Um, a WWE show, an AEW show, an Impact show, a New Japan show. I definitely do it once, um, just to get some pr just some viewing perspective. You have a favorite match? Well, the, my favorite match was mine. Oh yes, yes, yes. But wasn't it the fact that it wasn't actually your match, and that you were setting up for a future match? Exactly. So if you may have missed it, um. I said I was going to answer Jade Cargill's open challenge, and I didn't exactly answer it, but I showed up after it, stood face-to-face -face in the ring with her. Um, what a moment. My theme is so good. No, but in all seriousness, though, uh, every match was, was good. Um, hearing Matt Hardy's music was, was pretty cool. Um, I wanted to get up and do the dance, but I didn't because I went by myself. Um, <laughs> but All the there more were... reason to do the dance because you were I by know. yourself. Yeah, maybe, but like there was seeing like Cesaro, uh, sorry, Claudio um, and Mox and, and, and Yuta walk in through the crowd and like actually being able to see them and the spotlight following them. That was pretty cool because that was like in in front of me on the other side of the ring. So I could just see the top of their heads bobbing <laughs> through the people. Um, Dustin Rhodes came out and I wanted to cry. And then Keith Lee's music hit and I did cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just really cool. It was just a bunch of people that I never thought I'd be able to see wrestling live. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Even if it's just like a five minute match, it was it was cool. It was entertaining. It was fun. It was it was enjoyable. Although I did not watch all the matches. Was there one match in particular that you avoided for any? There might there might reason? have been there might have been one match in particular um that I that I walked out on and I'm gonna play a little bit of audio here. Yeah, uh, the the Jeff Jarrett guitar, me, 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 or however the fuck, um, it's still real to me. Damn it! So JJ's music hit, and I decided I would go to the bathroom <laughs> and and buy a shirt, maybe stretch my legs a little bit. That's it, though. <laughs> you got anything, Flo? No, I think we uh, nailed it all down there. It sounded like it was an overall exciting night. I'm more concerned that. The big show was there, and you said he was just a tiny being. That's kind of shocking, considering that you could. I was on the other from... side of the arena. <laughs> see him from across any street corner, but I did say he was a tall, dark, imposing shadow. <laughs> <laughs> not unlike Omos. Not not unlike Omos. Uh, so my brother-in-law was there with some of his friends as well, and they were in. Um, they were a section above me, right um, behind the cameras. So I saw some of his pictures. They had really nice seats too. He he got the picture of the big show for me. But of course I was like, that's not the big show, that's Paul. I'm, I'm like, glad it, you're able to go. Yeah, like in terms of storylines, like I don't really watch it, so I don't right. know. The MJF thing was cringy as all hell. Like he walked out and I was just like, ugh. 
I, I still really, I thought maybe live I'd appreciate him a little more, but I can't. I I can't do it. I love Darby <laughs> Allen. <laughs> yeah. And since we're talking about it, I think that, that was really the big thing other than the trios um, uh, tag title thing, really talking about MJF and Darby and Jungle Boy and Sammy being the four pillars of AEW when they first came out, them being the tent poles of the organization. I personally would throw Brit in there, but they're not going to absolutely mention a one. But Brit is is just as much of a, a pillar of AEW as any of those guys. And and I know I mentioned it. Um, well, while watching it, I would personally put um, Orange Cassidy in there and um, Ricky Starks as as pillars uh, almost more than like a Jungle Boy and, and a um, Sammy, but that's just personal preference for me. But it's I think it's really setting up for their next pay per view, which is all in. Um, I mean, double or nothing um, in May for a four way for the title. When you mention pillars of AEW though, don't you have to mention Jericho, Omega and Cody? Like yes, they but it started it. Right, but I think where they want they want these people to be the foundation that they continue to build on as opposed to the legends that are dying that started away. It. Okay, yeah. I understand that. I just wasn't sure entirely what um what the context was uh Flo I know you're a big Brit Baker fan how did you like her rocking the Canadian tuxedo it it was absolutely amazing she's finally getting the chance to go face which is just absolute top notch I'm excited that she gets to uh reveal this side of her getting a few uh cheers along the way as well but uh she's massive like Don Jay said definitely one of the pillars without a doubt about it just I mean, that women's division was pretty much built on her for so long. Yeah, even when they didn't put the title on her right away. It it definitely was um, her, Nyla Rose, and Riho, like the face of the women's division when they first started. And seeing um, where it is now, I'm still eh on Jade Cargill just being booked to go like 54 and 0 but for some reason they don't put her in the conversation with other women. However, with the arrival of Taya Valkyrie, maybe AKA that'll Goldie. change. AKA Goldie. Um all right, so let's go talk about Smackdown. A few things we want to touch on here. The first um we had the Fatal 5 way for um, determining the number one contender to the Intercontinental Championship. And they did the, their... Ha uh, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> like, did we have to do that? Did we, did we have to use the there's two refs, there's two pins, um, now the two of you are going to fight each other, and if for some reason it's still going to be a triple threat for context. Seamus and Drew pinned different people at the exact same time. Why there were two refs to begin with, I have no idea. Um, but they declared Seamus and Drew the winner. Gunter goes to Adam Pearce and was like, English isn't my first language, but I know the difference between plural and singular. Um, basically saying he didn't want more than one challenger. He wanted one challenger. Um, so they're making Seamus Drew to determine who's going to face him. Do we still think, uh, Flo, we'll start with you. Do we still think this is going to end up being a triple threat? Oh, without a doubt. I don't think there's any other way they can go with this, the, the way they ran it. Um, as you alluded to earlier, the match started and I immediately said to you, why is that ref outside the ring? What What is he doing there? Uh, yeah. And Silly. uh that's uh that that's where we ended up. I mean, he like so nonchalant for no reason slides into the ring and starts counting. It's like the other ref's not even down. Like what why? It it was very confusing altogether. Um Gunther got it right though. I mean, he's like, hey, with the plural and the singular, it's like I don't I'll face whoever, but they need to beat me for my title. They can't beat somebody else for the title. 
Sheamus can't pin Drew. Drew can't pin Sheamus. So I I understand what he's going at. It's the first time where I feel like it's not that he's scared of it, but he actually holds the prestige to this title where it's like, you know, I'll fight whoever, but they need to beat me for this title. And, and he always been- talks about um, the ring is sacred. So to your point, like he's a very traditional champion. If he loses the belt, he needs to be the one to lose it, not Sheamus pinning Drew, which is probably what's going to happen. I'm not doing predictions, but to your point, he's like that mat is sacred. You know, the gimmicks are stupid. This is how we wrestle traditional fashion. So, of course, he's not going to want to lose his belt by not getting pinned. Yeah, and that's just exactly it. It's like, it, it, it's the first time we fear, because you hear it all the time and you're like, oh, the champion's a coward. He's the heel. He's this. With with Gunther, it's like, you, you actually believe him. It's like, hey, I want to go. I want to kick this dude's ass. If he can kick my ass, that's fine. But he needs to kick my ass, not the guy standing next to us ass. Mm-hmm. Um, So pretty much it's, we got old sword ass and uh, old chalele ass. and Old chalele they're, ass. They're, they're just kind of getting in the middle of it. But I don't think, I mean, it's going to be interesting watching uh, SmackDown tomorrow night, but it's who is going to gain ground? Is there going to be interference? I don't think there's any way we get a clean victory out of it. No, They're just going to start the match with two refs again. It's going to um, be like a double disqualification and Adam Pierce will be like, you're both in the match. Just beat the living hell out of each other out of the match. Yep. Just, I mean, I can watch Sheamus and Drew go. It's the best match I've ever watched live. And it was at a house show. You would have thought it was a mania match. They went on for 40 minutes. It was mm. phenomenal. So I'm not mad that we're getting it, but it's kind of, all right, what are we actually getting? How, are we, how We know what we're getting. It's more of a how are we getting there. Yeah, What what is our journey here? We know the destination. Yeah, all right. Don Jay, what are your thoughts? I, I agree. I think they did what they did last week because we everybody was under the understanding of, oh, it's going to be a three-way. So by them doing it that Phrasing. way last Phrasing. By them do, having the ending that they had last week, it sets up the three-way match but not in the way that we want. So then when they say, oh, they'll fight one versus one on SmackDown, then it might, it puts that little seed of doubt in most in some people's minds saying that maybe we won't get a three-way match, all for it to end up being a three-way match anyway. So I think it was just more one of those um, taking a left when you should have taken a right, but you're going to get back on the interstate anyway just to... Um, put that little wrinkle in to, to get to that destination that we all know that we're getting to. Yeah. We'll talk more about it. Um, obviously we need to watch the match and we're not doing predictions yet. Cause we still have a little bit more time, uh, moving on with SmackDown. It looks like we're finally getting, um, a feud between judgment day and legato del fantasma. Don Jay, I know you're a big Santos guy. How are you liking this? It's a perfect match. It is we get three people, well, we actually get four versus four because we get Zelina versus Rhea in that piece, and then we can get all of Judgment Day and we get all of Legato, and they can put on great matches. And I know that there's a certain segment of the wrestling population who doesn't think of Zelina as a wrestler because she's a damn good manager, but she's wrestled for a while. She wrestled in Impact she for won, a while. She won Queen of the Ring. She is the reigning queen of the ring. Um... She was the body double and fighting with my family, the Paige movie. So she can wrestle. So and it can be believable. So I, I'm liking this grouping, and I want to see it a few times. Flo, yeah, uh, going up on Zelina. Zelina's kind of like the one where it depends on the question you ask. If you ask, "What does Zelina excel at?" and you're like, "Ah, eh, in the ring, you know, she's," the... but if you turn the question around and say, "What is Zelina bad at?" There's nothing. Can't I name mean, it. it. It's the she has the complete packages is to fulfill what she needs to do. So again, even going up against the Rayo on the other side, I don't think this is a mismatch at all. And I think she has uh, the talent and the will to take care of that. Um, what was really nice was seeing it be more than Santos. 
getting the rest yeah. of Legato into the match. Because we were absolutely... asking last week, where are they? Yep. <laughs> where where did they go? We, we were ready to put them on the milk carton. It, we, we were probably about a week away from putting them on the milk carton. I, I think that's what we need to do for a segment now. We need to have a milk carton segment each week. Where is this person? Um, I still have the where is where was LA Knight milk carton image <laughs> saved. It's still there. <laughs> Speaking it, of LA Knight, if I may <laughs> use that as a launch point, um, my boy was on Raw to face Cody Rhodes. Um, now, we all knew he wasn't going to win, but can we talk about the guy just consistently holding L's and still getting a pop and a fan reaction and constantly being thrown in storylines? Because he was in the Fatal Five way. Um, he obviously, he ate one of the pins, uh, but then he shows up on Raw to fine-tune Cody Rhodes, loses again, but we're absolutely not... I don't think this is normally when someone goes on a losing streak, we're like, oh, they're getting buried. Like Baron Corbin, the last guy to pin Roman Reigns. And I don't think he's won since. So for him, it looks like a downfall. But for LA Knight, he's won what? One match. And it was like against an enhancement talent. But he's. You know, he got to do the storyline with Bray Wyatt. He got to share the ring with The Undertaker. There are WrestleMania rumors, which I won't mention because they're rumors. It's dirt sheet. We don't have the the bullshit barbershop graphics set up entirely. But they're still putting him... Like, they had him in a match with, with Kofi and now Cody. And while Baron Corbin takes the L and it looks like a decline, LA Knight's taking the L, but it looks like an uprising. Uh, Don Jay, how do you view this? LA Knight's a pro. Everywhere he's been, he's a pro. And if if I can take any way, anything away from this, it's the fact that he was in the program with Bray and is still kicking. Like, I know that there's always been that fear that, oh, you're getting in a match with Bray or a series or a program with Bray and then you're buried. And he's come out like Rose. There's nothing a man can't do. Agreed. And even though he's he's been with the WWE for this is like his second shot with them. It's only been a few years. Um, he's cut his teeth in other promotions. I mean, the interview he did uh, saying Eli Drake is L.A. Knight. L.A. Knight is Eli Drake. So he's you know, he's refined this character elsewhere and he's well respected um, and in his 40s as well. So. Shout out to the older talents getting it done. Flo, what do you have to say on the matter? Um, To our surprise, I think you hit my comparison that I was going to bring up directly on the head when it comes to the, the Baron Corbin analogy Why are there. you surprised? <laughs> I'm not. Okay. <laughs> but um, that's what I said, that nobody's surprised. But, uh, oh. but it's just that, and it's like he's doing what Corbin hasn't been able to do of recently. He's collecting these L's, but he's become the lovable loser, per se. Um, it, it's no matter what, he's collecting the L's. He's not winning the matches, but you're watching the matches. You're like, wow, this guy's got it. He's mm -hmm. this. Every time he does that box jump, you go absolutely was apeshit. just about to say, <laughs> that box jump gets me every time. Every single time. It's just like, wow. And then it reinvigorates it to a point where you just want to keep watching again and again and just I mean, to, to sum it up, the only thing there is to say is, yeah. 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 On the other side of that, his opponent, Cody Rhodes, I didn't really, when I when I planned what we were going to talk about today, I didn't really put anything bloodline related in it. Um, because I, I don't say this as a criticism or as a disrespect or as a concern. Um, I just feel like it's more of the same. We're just slowly building up to this match. Um, Cody cuts his promo. KO doesn't want any help. Solo gonna solo. Uso is gonna Uso. Um, is there anything um, kind of bloodline related that the two of you want to touch on? Uh, Don Jay, we'll start with you. I don't know. Do you have anything you want to add? Not really. Um, I think it was great to see Jay with his brother on SmackDown. 
Um, and I'm, I think in terms of Cody, Bloodline story, nothing is going to grab hold unless Roman is there. Like, Cody can talk to Paul and they can have great promos. He can inter- he can interact with the Bloodline, Solo, Jay or Jimmy, or help Sammy or anything like that. But as far as I'm concerned, his involvement is with Roman. And I don't really care about any other real interactions that he has with the Bloodline unless he's with Roman. I I I agree. And it goes back to when they were even when they were doing the face to face promo, I thought Roman was the clear winner in it and Cody was just like a Yeah, you right. That's why I'm doing it. I don't know. Cody can cut a good promo, but the feeling out. I think that was more the feeling out process. Because Roman does it week after week after week against people after people after people. And Cody does great promos, but usually those promos are in the ring by himself. Yep. I agree. Um, Flo, I know you're a big KO fan. I know you're a big solo fan. Um, do you have anything you want to mention about Bloodline stuff this week, other than it's family shit? Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much what needs to be mentioned, is Jay this week pretty much confirmed exactly what everybody thought and why he did what he did to Sammy was because he had to. He never said it was because he wanted to. He never said it was because it was the right thing to do. He came out and he said, this is my family, this is what I had to do. There's speculation that, I mean, he did whisper in Sammy's ear before kicking his teeth out. There's speculation that, hey, if I didn't go back, my brother was going to get his ass kicked. Not solo, because apparently they're not brothers, at least. Apparently not they're brothers. not related, yeah. Um, but I, I think that was the important thing that came out of the week that adds to the questions for the yep. best supporting actor. I was, was going to say, even though Jay came out and said what he said, I still think it's a work. It's I, I agree. Like everything he said, it was, I had to do. He never said I wanted. Yep. He never said I was torn. He never said anything else other than this is my family. This is what I had to do. Why are you questioning me? What other option did I have? And that's what it came down to. Roman set a deadline and Jay had to do something before said deadline. Um, It is going to be interesting on Raw, seeing them all back in the same house. I'm not sure if they're all going to be in the same house on SmackDown or not. I'm not sure Roman was confirmed for it, but uh, they were all confirmed for Raw. So I guess uh, it is mania season. Everybody's going to be everywhere. Um, And the the rest of the storyline as is, I know a little tidbit on KO. KO said that I'm going to be the better solo than solo and try to go solo. And of course, it doesn't work out for him. Um, Even though he has damage controlled them in the past countless times. He has. um, This was not one of the times he was able to take advantage. Goddamn walking through that back curtain. (laughs) Those super kicks. But um, so, I I mean, it it, it comes down to his... uh, Everybody's looking forward to who's helping who. So it's, uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe by the end of this, we get a KO and Solo tag team. Jay and Sammy get back together. We'll put Jimmy with Cody. We're, we're just going to mix match here. And we're going to throw together one of those giant SmackDown tag tournaments. And we're going to go from there. I, but, just, uh, I feel like the only thing I want out of Monday is KO and Sammy wearing hoodies and coming out of the crowd. That seems to be the consistent thing. There's there's still a lot going on that we don't entirely know what to expect. And that's that's the beauty of it is the unknown. Uh, moving on from the bloodline to another tag team that all of us love ever so dearly. Um, and now they're getting uh, beat up by Austin Theory, sadly. But Theory needs to look strong going into WrestleMania, why they have to do solo matches with, I mean, I'm happy they're getting TV time. Don't get me wrong, but why they're choosing the street profits for this. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so theory went one-on-one with Dawkins, uh, theory wins and then puts the, um, the STFU on Dawkins, which makes me, um, all the more hopeful that he's going to walk out with a spinner belt. So this is the weird case where this is the one time I was kind of happy the Street Profits got beat up on. 
And what? It, it stems back to last week. Last week, Theory got castrated by John Cena. It, it wasn't. It was an absolute burial, a murder. We were all doing the casket dance. It was absolute destruction of him. Which it was Don't like know where his balls are still. still yeah, we're still looking for them. Somewhere. They're in the red solo. They're on the, cups. They're in the meal carton. Yeah, they're in the red solo cups. They're in the solo cups. But it was like, man, what what did that do for you? You got your match. You got absolutely destroyed. And it wasn't just like Theory was like, hey, give me the, the super face tag team, the one that you can't help but cheer for. He came out and promoted them into the ground. It, this is true. And he this just literally, it came off like it was his rebuttal, even though it wasn't at Cena directly. He came out and there was like three times. It was like, damn, damn. Okay. And then he goes into the ring. And yes, I know it was against my man Dawkins. And I the, think he's the fat the and out of shape one, forward. the fat and out of shape Dawkins. Yeah. Y'all crazy for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, confidence using the Cena's moves. And it's like, he just keeps getting more impressive. And it was like he answered the questions. That's kind of what his character has been built to be. I go back to that stupid ass open challenge for the briefcase. And it was like everybody thought he was dead. It was like, la I mean, I think last podcast we were all saying like, he's dead. How does he get up from this? And somehow he always manages to be the phoenix and rise back from the ashes. And he bites back so hard. So... Again, against my profits, but I, I like the direction that this one took, and I, I'm hoping it continues to build up to that Mania match. Theory is just the type of person that you want to punch in the face, and because he's just so handsome, he's so built, he's so athletic, so it's He is easy. not handsome. There's a great segment of the population that thinks that he is an attractive human being. That being there. said, he, he's perfect for what they, WWE wants. The, the smug, cocky, young person. He's the yep. Grayson Waller of Raw. Ooh. Um, Ooh. And Hold on. Hot take. That's a hot take right there for you. I wasn't expecting that. Hold on. Huh. He's the, he's, he's the, he's the Grayson Waller of Raw. I don't, I don't hate that. I don't hate that and, at all. And to Flo's point, he got off the mat. After last week, after the previous week, and you don't want it. My, I think we we had the initial question: Why the profits? As yeah, the, as the, the punching bag, for lack of a better phrase. I can think of anybody that I would have him go against that are on that same on that same level of of recognition. Like their faces that have an edge to them, mm -hmm. but he's already been against like people like Dolph. He's already been against people like um, Ali or... Yeah, I was going to say, like, what do you do? Feed him to Baron Corbin to hold right. another L? And so. they have enough um, prestige and gravitas within the universe, WWE universe, where, yes, they can put on a great match. Yes, this is viable. And nothing that Theory said was incorrect about missed opportunities and things like that about either one of them. So I thought it was a perfect fit for that. And then obviously Monday we're going to see um, Ford versus Theory. Um, probably with a similar result. Yeah. But there, sometimes you're, you're that's why it's a, it's a whole team project. Sometimes you got to lift somebody up and somebody has to be put to the side a little bit, but they'll get their moment in the sun. Yeah, as much as it hurt, um, because we're all really big Street Profits fans, um, he, he wasn't wrong. He wasn't wrong. I do want to give a shout out to um, Natalia, though, uh, tweeting out after the match how proud she was of Angelo Dawkins, um, him being a Heart Dungeon yep. product. Um and yeah, we look at them as a tag team and we said, okay, Montez Ford is going to go solo in the chamber. What does this mean for Dawkins? I think Dawkins had a fantastic showing in that match. Um, I think he they needed to do something to make him look just as strong as a solo competitor because everyone's talking about Montez and having this 
bright future. Like after the chamber MVP tweeting out, like this is the guy. Um, and Dawkins was just never really put in a position to have that conversation about. So in that respect, I was really happy to see Dawkins get a solo match. They gave it good time. They gave him a good opponent. Even though he lost, he still looked really strong as a solo competitor. Um, Because the Priest match, it wasn't like that. But I I liked seeing Dawkins get get his flowers. Because, again, he always gets called the the fat and out of shape one. So it was nice to see him uh, get some respect as a solo competitor. Speaking of tag teams going solo, Otis had a photo shoot. And Chad Gable's walking around with flyers in the back saying, have you seen Otis? Um, Important, maybe not important, but like interesting to note, the jacket Chad Gable was wearing was American Alpha, not Alpha Academy. Shout out Jason Jordan. Uh, But Otis is in the back just serving up looks. Um, Do we think, uh, Flo, I'll start with you. Uh, Is it inevitable at this point that they get split up and Gable becomes a solo competitor? I hope so. It's time to free Gable. And again, I think the, uh, the jacket was the big hint there that it's about to be Gable time. Um, I think it's time for him to be freed. Um, Otis can, uh, still be able to, uh, work well with them, gives them a dominating big man, a little bit of, uh, name value to that faction but uh i i think uh we're, we're just biding our time till it, it, it's kind of like unlocking the cuffs on gable to do i just hope they do the right thing and uh send them on the uh the propeller upwards i'm glad that he's going to get the opportunity to redeem himself because lest we forget he was shorty g not mm-hmm. too long ago so to be able to fend off that horrible gimmick and be in the conversation uh, of the WWE universe, us who love him to death, as someone who can be a singles player and it's time for him to be a singles player. We didn't think he had any personality for the longest time when he did that that stuff, but is he has personality. We call him Angle 2.0. He is just... a entertaining guy doing his own stick and can wrestle his ass off. So it's it's perfect time for him. Right after WrestleMania, put him in a SummerSlam, like all summer build him up. Um and let's go. Yep. Uh, to further that point, um post mania would love to see him and, and Austin Theory feuding. I think that would be a really yep. good fit. Um, two other notes about Raw. We do have another WrestleMania match confirmed, and it is Edge against Balor. This is not done. They're going to have another match. Um, at Hell in a Cell, which is the name of a pay-per-view, um, at WrestleMania. Um, I'm assuming we're getting Brood Edge versus Demon Finn. Donje, is that, that the only way this is going to play out? It needs to. Because we need, hell, we need... hell can't contain his demons or whatever it is he said. Mm-hmm. And if the um the ring um if the ropes break, he's still in a cage. So it God. won't end just like that. It's not a title match, the rope's not gonna break. But this is the one this is the way it has to be. And WrestleMania is a spectacle, so why don't you have one of your biggest profile type of matches on the grandest stage of all? And I think this is we're going to the sunset of Edge being the full-time wrestler again and him finally retiring for real this time, what this looks like. So give him the matches that he wants before he goes. And if he wants a hell in a cell, give the man a hell in a cell. Flo, I have a question for you, and I'm not trying to hurt your feelings with this. Do you think Balor coming out um, as the demon at WrestleMania is believable after how he lost the title match against Roman. Do you think enough time has passed? Hmm. Right. Because that was my fear with 
that match is like, how do you bring out the demon and then do him like that? So do you think maybe enough time has gone by that we can bring the demon back and have him be this vicious, imposing force again? Well, I think the bloodline gods have forgiven him um, for for whatever he did that caused the, the ropes to immaculately break down and cause him to lose that match. I'm starting to get that goosebump vibe feeling I know, that I had I'm in that sorry. match that was just completely <laughs> crushed and torn away. I, I so flipped I'm, that on you too. You weren't expecting that. I'm sorry. I'm I, I I was all ready to take this a different route, and now you we're, can take it a different route. Now we're I'm here. sorry. In the match, looking at it, and you look at, I guess I I'm not looking for exactly Brood Edge as much as I'm looking for the Judgment Day Edge that we seen at the beginning of the Judgment Day. Um. Ooh, if that he comes out with that flaming throne. With the flaming throne. Ooh, and I mean, we're, we're going to hell and pretty much you have like the Duke Nukem version of Edge from hell going <laughs> against the demon. Yeah. Not even, I mean, and, and this is one where you look at and I mean, you lock both of them inside the cell. I mean, you're, you're fighting your demons in hell and it's like, who wins this match? It, it, it was kind of like the I quit match with Edge. You knew he wasn't going to quit. Until? Until that, that side stipulation was added. But I don't think any of those side stipulations are existing in the cell. And that's why we're going there. And yeah, because like, I think everyone else has something else they're doing, right? Can Edge put the demon down? Can the demon put Edge down? And it's just like, I mean, this might be the 2.9 bowl of the year mm -hmm. because it's like who possibly ends this i mean is i think this the, i think this match resurgence? i think this match might steal the show it's it's very they work yeah. so well together in terms of an actual wrestling matchup i think this might be the match but again the full card hasn't been announced yet that's just me future casting but I think yeah, this it's, it's be... going to be phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just, I don't know who takes the L. <laughs> I don't either. Um, speaking of WrestleMania matches, the Raw Women's Champion, Bianca Belair, um, wins a match once again, once again gets double teamed. Asuka once again comes and makes the save. And the logical course of action here, because they apparently can't beat each other up, is to make them tag together. Um, we saw this last year. Was it last year or the year before? Um, Bianca, it was the year before. Uh, Bianca, Sasha. Can they coexist? Is there a reason why they can't just have women beat the shit out of each other? Like, as much as I hate Rhonda... The the brawl with Ronda, Becky, and Charlotte leading into their Mania match was so good. They're beating the crap out of each other in cop cars. They're kicking windows in. They're kicking faces in. But Asuka and Bianca just... Eh? Donjay. Why do we keep doing this? The challenge with this match is that it's face-face. And even even with Asuka making her dark clown change kind of change, Asuka's still a face. And Bianca is a face. And they don't want to do the... But uh, but you can start to see that Bianca's getting pissed off um, with the antics of Asuka. Um, so I think they're going that route. But the, the I don't know why they couldn't just go to Braun Mellow route. Which I was we'll just about on, to bring that up. Which we'll touch on later. But I think it's the fact that, that they have mutual respect for each other. They absolutely do. But Asuka has this little bit of crazy that is leaking out. And Bianca has black woman crazy that can turn on a dime as soon as she takes off her earrings. I didn't want to say it. Go that route but I was I, absolutely I, I, thinking it. So with that being said... They now they just basically have to figure out how to get through two more Raws to get to WrestleMania, and I don't necessarily like I don't need a story for them. 
I, it's just one of those manufactured stories that they're trying to get us all the way to WrestleMania for. But I don't need a story for them because that match is going to kick ass. I mean, I don't think I need a story for them either, but I also don't need them tagging with each other two weeks before. Um, Flo, why why are we constantly trying to get WrestleMania opponents to coexist? I have no idea, and I'm so bored of all the women's storylines going on. It's not even okay. silly. Send me to NXT. I, uh, I'm in a great yeah. year. Like, it's just so... Bo- I mean, it was the same thing. We literally just watched the same thing two weeks in a row. I think we switched the opponents, maybe. Now we're going to tag together, mm-hmm. and it's just like, okay, Asuka comes out, makes the save. Again, it's kind of like how... It, you I you mean, really want to make Bianca look weak? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Or we're, we're making Bianca look weak now that Asuka has to come save and do one kick and she saved and then Asuka's yeah. either going to do some miss stuff, she's going to dance around with the belt, do just Asuka things. And it's just the like... The air guitar thing with the belt was kind of cool, though. I it, thought that was cute. It was, I mean, it was the comical Asuka. I mean, it yeah. was great. I mean, it's not bad. It's just nothing is sticking. I mean, it's just like we're throwing... There's no development. Like there's no seasoning in the sauce. This is like plain sauce here. It's just like we're we're getting there. We're know where we're going. I agree with Don Jay. The match is gonna be great. There's no way it's not gonna be. But I mean, give me some feeling going into this match. Like, why do why do I want this match other than it's just gonna be a great match? Why I mean, okay, she won. Oscar's gone a little bit crazy. Uh Bianca's not stepping down to her, she's just kind of getting annoyed. Yeah, which, which is more weird. It's like okay, Bianca's not getting mad enough to like attack her. I guess that's why we have to team them together to show they can't coexist and they can one up each other. And it's just like I'm bored with it. And you bring up Ronda earlier, and that was the one thing about Ronda is when she had the title. I mean, they, they were at least fighting with somebody every week. They were scrapping with somebody, even though they were jumping somebody, beating their ass. That was the line of it. I mean, yeah, Charlotte and Rhea aren't even like. They talk to each other a little. I mean, Ray is running, per se. I mean, you could call it mind games. It's like they're not even doing anything. The story's there. Hey, this is the rematch from what happened. Now we're switching it up. Yeah. But it's it's but, just but, like... But with that storyline, you, um, you have your face and you have your heel, at least. Yeah. So they'll talk shit. And And that's the weird thing is with Charlotte being the face, it's so not in her character that it's just like, you know, I, I'm the champion. I need a match. That's not Charlotte Flair, Charlotte Flair. Hey, I'm the top of the mountain. I'm the pedestal. Who wants to earn their match? Like everything is so weird right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying that Charlotte can't be a face. I'm not saying it couldn't run this way, but I don't think we all, I don't think any of us expected it when she came back. Yes, I don't think she expected it. <laughs> but she it's, didn't. <laughs> it's uh, it's just going off. It's like everything is just so weird. And then I, I'm not even sure if we're going to highlight on it the other women's storyline with the legends going on. Yeah. I mean, they got damage controlled backstage and that was it. I don't think there was anything else with the story all night. Oh, we're mad now. Oh, everybody hit your mad emote. You're like, we're, we're mad. Okay. It's like they gave me nothing over two shows to care about. So I was so quickly to interject on that. We complained how horrible it was last week. So I think less was more for them this week. I'd agree. So I think that's that's the route they went. My biggest thing about Raw was that we had one woman women's match the entire night. Like the, the whole three hours, we did we didn't have the consistency. We got Chelsea. And by God, I'm glad we have Chelsea on our Mm -hmm. screen every week because she's fantastic. And I said it in in our server that she can be a SmackDown Women's Champion right now if if they booked her correctly and put her over there. Um, But they have to do something for us to care about this match. And we're two and a half weeks left for WrestleMania, and they have tag titles that are still not going to be defended on WrestleMania unless they do something like Monday. Yeah, just give us us some content. Give us some seasoning. Give us some spice. Give me something. to. I'll give you spice. I'll give you spice. No, no, no. I'm giving you spice right now. Oh, dear. NXT. Thank God. Here's a women's division. Speaking of spice in the women's division. Good Lord. 
It is night and day with how NXT books their women and how Raw and SmackDown book their women. We have a little bit of continuity, Don J's favorite thing, or one of Don J's favorite things. Um, so they do this, this medical angle with Roxanne. Um, and we kind of went like, okay, she'll be taking a week off or two. And then they completely flip it on us. And they're like, we don't think she's going to be medically able to compete. So we're putting the title on the line in a ladder match at Stand and Deliver. And we going to have some qualifiers. So our, go- our girl, Sol Ruka, walked out and we went, great. She's going to be in a ladder match. And then Zoe Stark's music hit and we went, crap, we're not getting Sol in the ladder match. <laughs> Um, we also had Kiana James against Gigi Dolan. Gigi won that. Zoe won hers. I don't recall how many competitors they said were going to be in this match. They didn't. Um, but apparently JC has a separated shoulder. I feel like she'll be on TV next week and qualify because they want to build more of this Gigi JC thing. Tiffany Stratton, maybe. Indy Hartwell, maybe. But are we all kind of feeling like Roxanne's going to be in this match anyways and she'll win? Yep. For sure. It's going to be, I mean, anytime you want to have a women's match with a stipulation, whether it's TLC, cage match, falls count anywhere, no disqualification, like I'm, I'm good with it. I love seeing women get more um, non-traditional wrestling matches. Um, so seeing a ladder match for the championship, I'm, I'm already invested. I'm already super excited. Also with the women's division, we have the team of Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, otherwise known as Golden Ivy. Shout out to the, the DJ Booth Wrestling Federation, uh, the Golden Ivy team. They are the number one contenders to Kiana and Fallon, they broke up yet another team, which is the issue with the women's division, is they put teams together, and then they break up Tatum and Ivy for some reason. Kaden and Katana, are they getting called up? I hope so. That's the issue. That seems to be the one constant of, hey, we need an actual female tag team, and I... I, I don't it's think them. there's anybody better. It's them. Yeah, I don't think that's that's um I don't think that's a stretch by any means. They work so well together. They're so cohesive. They were the longest reigning female tag champs in history on any of their brand. So I can't wait for them to go main roster just to get split up uh because the tag teams don't matter apparently. Um we do have hosts for Stand and Deliver. Yes, Boy. boys. That's going to be fun as hell. Do you think they're going main roster too? Yep. For sure. Yeah, they lost to Gallus. And then they're like, we don't have anything to do with stand and deliver. Let's host it. So yeah, it feels like feels like some NXT tag teams are gonna get called up. We do have Ilya Dragunov and JD McDonough happening on regular ass television next week. Flo just Tell me literally anything about this because I I don't have words for it. I love them both. This is it's gonna be a fight. This is the absolute chaos angle, and they might have had to push this to TV because if it was on the pay per view, I think uh, Braun Mello would be second to this match, and I'll say that. But uh, I, I don't disagree. You have JD and Dragon. I mean, this is just going to be absolute electric. I talked a little bit about Sheamus and Drew earlier. This is the NXT equivalent of that, where they're just going to mm. go. And not only are they going to go, if you watch the show, we were expecting them to show up <laughs> all week everywhere. We didn't yep. care if it was at a certain superstar's house, the NXT parking lot, the boiler room. No, not room. the NXT parking lot. No, no. no. Okay, yeah. Not don't the, the NXT. No, NXT. we Nobody don't need any more injuries. Yes. We don't need any more injuries. <laughs> yes, because we need this match. But literally, like you were just expecting them to show up at Scopely headquarters. You name it, they were going to show <laughs> up at it at this point. Like You bring it, up an interesting point. I never even thought of that because I was saying like, 
this should be a match reserved for a premium live event. I when never they said thought next of... week, we hit yeah. the old thing hard. We we looked at each straight looked at each other. What? What? Huh? No? What? This but is... you bring up a really good point: is if you put that match on stand and deliver, do you want Braun Mello looking bad? Not that they're gonna like look bad, but Ilya and JD McDonough, that's going to be a show stealer. Like when um, Ambrose and KO had that no disqualification or whatever it was at the Royal Rumble. And like that was better than the freaking Rumble match. You see a pace of a match go off the charts. Wait till you just see these two. It's going to be absolute insanity. And it's like, you can't even make a prediction just like how you passed it off to me. It's just like... <laughs> Just let it happen. Give give it to us. And it's just going to be a continuation of ass whooping and nonstop. And it's just going to be internal goodness, whether it's next week, whether it's the PLE, whether it's two weeks after that, whether it's the Monday after all, anything, just, just keep giving it. Don Jay, what do you think about this matchup? Yep. 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 That's all I got. Bet the only way they would have been able to do this at stand in delivery is if they would have put it on first because you'd have to keep them completely separate and you'd have the like the the banger match at the very beginning of the show to get and then the banger hyped match up, at the end, and then you had the banger at the end. But I'm glad that we're just getting on regular ass TV. It's gonna be it's gonna be fantastic. I hope that's a long standing feud similar to when we had like the three peat with Elia and Walter. And I say Walter because that was his name back then. Um, I hope we get some kind of a trilogy with Ilya and JD McDonough because that'll be that'll be incredible. Um, we have a little bit of continuation with the Gargano and Waller feud, and I love everything Grayson Waller does. My man went to Johnny's house, kicked his ass in his own front yard. The problem I had with it. Very was, big problem. Like, Candace just kind of opens the door holding the baby and was like, no, 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 stop, stop. That's my husband. No, what are you doing? Girl, go inside, put the baby down, grab a baseball bat, get that man off your lawn. What are you doing? I've seen this woman whoop a grown man's ass before. She's I don't know. wrestled dudes. I don't know what was going on through you her head. You live but in Florida. But yeah, it was. Uh, what? Will you stop, please? Go, get, go, Florida go man. His ass. The baby had colic. Couldn't put the baby <laughs> down. Oh um, God. And and the baby was much more important. No, stop, please, don't do it. I'm in full agreement with you guys, but oh. I think I just think the baby had colic. Okay. I don't have kids, so I don't know what that means, but whatever. <laughs> um, nor do I care. Um, one more fuck thing. Yeah, fuck them kids, especially my own. I don't have kids. Um, I was going to say one more thing. I actually have two more things I want to talk about with NXT. Uh, one of which was, listen, some podcasts go their entire lifespan without getting this. It took We're Gonna Talk About Wrestling seven episodes. We got our amicable contract signing. We've been saying it for weeks. Contract signing, both parties walk in, you sit down, you have a conversation, you sign the contract, you stand up, you face each other, you shake hands, you leave. Gentlemen, we did it. We did it. It's it's beautiful. I mean, I I couldn't believe it after the uh after it happened. It was just like we it's we kept predicting it. We kept giving it hope. We kept giving it credit and when the rest of the world put us down, Braun Breaker and Carmelo Hayes gave us what we all deserved in the actual contract signing of the century. There w there was a little bit of table banging, deservedly so, but it was fine. still it was uh it was it, it was just a beautiful moment and is definitely going to be a high spot on this podcast for a long time. I can't 
begin to put into words how happy the storyline makes me. Because like I said last week, I don't need people just disrespecting each other because one is a heel and your job is to disrespect people. I am totally fine with this being a matter of respect. Even Trick Williams in the background was like, he wasn't wilding out like Trick normally does, right? He was just kind of there wearing a leather one piece. I don't know what he was rocking. <laughs> he could not have been comfortable. In but Florida. In, in Florida, Florida. It looked like he was rocking like a leather shirt with a leather tie and leather <laughs> pants and a freaking blazer on top. Listen, you want to talk say anything you, either. You want to talk chiseled of granite? We sleep on Trick Williams in that respect. Dude is an Adonis, but you never know it because of all the stuff he wears, but that's why he wears it. We did have a little bit of drama, um, self-induced, with Pretty Deadly coming out to host the contract signing. And as soon as they walked out and we all looked at the table, we went, yep, that's how that's ending. Uh, but it was, you know, Braun and Mello at the end, flexing their muscles and respect. Let's go have this match. Um, the other thing I want to talk about NXT is NXT level up. After SmackDown, is it on Peacock? It is on Peacock after SmackDown. Yeah, yep. so they have half an hour of NXT level up matches. And these are taped before the Tuesday episode of NXT. You basically just get three matches. And that's it. So my girl, Miss Jackson, Jakara Jackson, wrestled Indy Hartwell. We had the Super Diva wrestling scripts like we just we get to see people that don't get a lot of tv time there's no like storylines there's no vignettes you got byron saxon on commentary like i might be by myself here but it is the most enjoyable half hour of of wrestling programming i watch every week um don Jay, how do you view nxt level up I like Level Up because it's there's a what NXT there's a progression that a lot you go to PC and you work some live events, but you need TV time, but you're not ready for the TV time. So we put you on Level Up so you can get in front of an audience, get on tape, things like that. And I think it helps the people polish some of the things before they hit that main NXT loop and. It also gives people an opportunity to see who's who's potentially going to be next. So I love how they do that. And like you said, it's bare bones. You get third, you get three matches. You go boom, 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 and you come again next week. And I like that they brought down, um, I guess, an NXT veteran. I don't not brought down, but um, Jakara Jackson has had maybe a handful of matches. They put her against Indy Hartwell. If you ever need to showcase someone and see what they can do, put them against an Indy Hartwell. I thought Jakara looked incredible. Um, Flo, what do you think about NXT Level Up? So agreeing with both of you, I think the one word I'm going to use for it is refreshing, and we're going to capital or we're going to capitalize the word fresh in it. It's mm -hmm. just quick hitting action, and we watch it together every week, and it's just like it's the most exciting where we're asking questions it's like who is this per wow that's incredible who is this why aren't they on tv more we go follow their instagrams their we go twitters follow Instagram, we're looking up old matches we're like game. yeah quincy we, we jones came and back and i was like wait <laughs> wait a second yeah from halloween half okay let me get on that instagram real quick like <laughs> absolutely great follow i recommend and, he's, and they're just serving it. up looks <laughs> yes it is it, it, it's amazing but it's it, it, it's something you might not know about, and I would encourage you just to check one out. And it's just so it's a quick hitting half hour. It flies by um, and it's just exciting, intense message. And it's kind of like you get to see the people that you don't get to quite see every week. And there is a uh, we say how good the roster is now. And it looks like it's not going to stop anytime soon with some of these up and comers. I think 
with with Monday you have Raw, with Tuesday you have NXT, with Wednesday you have AEW, with Thursday you have Impact, with Friday you have SmackDown. I think it's a really fun way to cap off a week of wrestling. You have so much happening storyline wise with all these different promotions. And then at the end of the week, you sit down, you go bang, bang, bang. Here's three matches. No muss, no fuss. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's exciting. You get to see kind of like after watching all this professional wrestling, it's like, here's more of the future of professional wrestling. And it gets you excited for wrestling. (laughs) So I think it's a really nice way to cap off the week. Um, A really nice way to cap off this podcast would be to mention we do have two named Hall of Fame inductees. Rey Mysterio is one of them, which I am in no way saying he's not deserving. It was more um, surprising to hear him going in this early while he's still wrestling. Um, and then the second one, the great Muda. Um, Don Jay, tell us about Muda. Muda is an icon over in Japan. He had great matches in WCW. I think one of my favorite WCW, that's what it was. Yeah, WCW. Um, and I think one of my favorite matches um is Muda versus Sting. They had some Mm -hmm. epic wars, obviously, in part of one of his retirement matches, he wanted to have Sting as one of his final... It actually was his final opponent. Um, so just the mutual respect that they've had over the years. Uh, you can't think Japanese wrestling without Muda. Uh, so I am personally glad that he's going into the hall. And obviously with WWE owning WCW, you can just slip him in there and, and yep. nobody will bet an eye. Agreed. Flo, um, when they announced Rey Mysterio, you and I both just kind of sat there and went, huh? Yeah, it's kind of digging into the uh, to the storyline aspect, and that's what we discussed a little bit, is it's like, how much of this is real? How much of this is storyline? How much is merged? Is it mixed? Who does it? Are we, are we going to get Rey and Dom uh, attacking uh, Conan doing the, uh, the, the, the induction oh, I hope not. I, I mean that that's what it's kind of like is it's like But it feels like it is, right? Because it, yes. He comes out on SmackDown. He comes out on SmackDown to be like, "Wow." He doesn't even get to say a word and then Dominic Mysterio's music hits. So yeah. then it's like Rey Mysterio is coming back to Raw and he actually gets to talk a little bit. But then Dominic Mysterio's music hits. And I realize that Ray is a very family-oriented man, and I'm assuming he would have to sign off on all of this, but can we just like can we just give him the moment without Dominic? And that's gonna be the hard part of it, but I mean it's definitely gonna push that heel heat. And I know Ray being the family man he is, it's like he's giving it all pushing it towards his son. I mean, when he leaves, he's going to be more proud of his son than he is for however many X amount of years he's done Mm -hmm. this. As we've discussed, you've discussed countless times, is there a better family man in WWE? And it's just, this is, there's no doubt about it. He approved, he signed off on anything. I wouldn't be surprised if he has 98% creative control of where this is going and how he wants to do it because that's what he deserves for how good he is, how good he was, how good he always will be. I don't know because I agree with you in the terms of it's like he needs his honorary induction the, the normal way and the way he wants to do it. But, I mean, let's be honest, Rey Mysterio never did anything conventional in his life, so why start here? That's a really good point to end things on. Um, Gentlemen, is there anything else that happened this week um, in the ring, outside of the ring, that we want to touch on? No, I think the only thing I will add to the Rey Mysterio Hall of Fame piece is that if we don't get an announced match between him and Dom before Hall of Fame, I think, yes, they will build it off of the Hall of Fame speech. And the other thing is, it's in California. It's 619. If they're just the perfect place for him to go, because it looks like he's towards the end of his run. Um, so if you're going to put him in, this is as good as years, any, especially where they're doing it. 
Um, I do actually have one more question now that I think of it. Um, and it's Rey Mysterio adjacent. But if Rey Mysterio is going into the Hall of Fame in California, he, he's going as a headliner. Do we get Batista this year too? I and we're we're not at the bullshit barbershop, but I read somewhere earlier today that he's still gonna be filming somewhere. Therefore, they don't think he would get there, and I think that would be a cold headline. Uh, yeah, because um, they tagged together be, too, right? Yeah, they tagged together. Ray is the greatest luchador in the history of of wrestling. Um, Sorry, I but if, at, but if you look at the credentials of Batista being a tag champ, multiple time world champion, like he has more WWE credentials than Ray yep. would. So there's six of one and half dozen of the other. They would be co-headliners as far as I'm concerned. Um if they if he were to go in, but as of right now I'm saying that he may not be able to make it. But we'll get our third not um inductee tomorrow. I, I don't think necessarily there has to be a direct headliner. Of it, I mean, this is L.A. It's supposed to be big. This is Hollywood. So, I mean, maybe you we see a bunch of tier one, tier two names projected thrown in there. Um, I I don't think who you go in with. I mean, I I think it would be cool personally to be like, hey, I I'm pretty badass. I went in with these other two guys that are fucking badass. Let's yeah. go in together. I like don't Vader think going in cool. with Taker. Exactly. Like, two high-level comparison. You could put them both on the card. and RVD going in with Kane. Exactly. Yeah. Just, just pair them up. I mean, I don't think they look at it in that way of like, shit, well, I'm going in with this guy, so nobody cares about me. It's not like I the mean, NBA Hall of Fame where Chris Bosh feels this type of way, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Love Chris Bosh, but come on, man. <laughs> All right, that is going to do it for this week's episode of We're Gonna Talk About Wrestling. Enjoy SmackDown, enjoy Raw, enjoy NXT, enjoy AEW, Impact, Startup, New Japan, whatever you are watching this coming week. We hope you enjoy it. And thank you again for listening. Bye. Bye, guys. See you later.